Hello, people of YouTube. I'm almost positive that my technology is not working today. Most, most of it failed. I've been trying to get it back up. Um, but you should have something like sound that may or may, or may not be in one channel. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about today's news, breaking news, uh, the Comey testimony. I'm going to call it the, the Comey fog. Uh, it's like a fog of confirmation bias. Uh, everybody got a little something to love today. So if you thought the president was doing horrible things, you heard some things that would make you think, yeah, that sounded like horrible stuff. And if you thought the president did nothing but his job, what you heard was, well, he did nothing but his job. So everybody got a little bit of what they wanted today. But let's talk about some of the, uh, the specifics. Um, the... Uh, <laughs> The biggest question is uh, around President Trump asking Comey in a private meeting for his loyalty. Uh, when Comey promised to give him his honesty instead, uh, President Trump uh, waited a little bit and then later he brought it up again and asked for his honesty. Uh, I'm sorry, President Trump asked for his loyalty. Comey promised his uh honest loyalty or some version of honesty and loyalty and president trump said yes that's what i want now here's how to interpret this <laughs> if president trump believed that he was guilty or that people close to him were guilty then asking uh, asking comey to give him his loyalty whether he said honesty or not under that context that would be really sketchy behavior and something that you should be worried about. But President Trump is probably the one person who knows if he committed any crimes or if he, if he personally colluded with anybody and apparently he's not, not uh, accused of that yet, at least not by anybody uh, in law enforcement. Um, if President Trump knew that he had done nothing wrong and was pretty sure that nobody else on his team had, as far as he knows, then asking somebody for their honesty and their loyalty is kind of the same thing. Because um, if you're innocent, the FBI's honesty will get you everything you want. All right? Unless, what is the one situation where you'd have to worry? The one situation you'd have to worry is if the FBI decided not to be independent and decided to be disloyal <laughs> to the Constitution, to the oath of the office, to the president, to the citizens. All right? So a president asking for honesty uh, and or uh, loyalty seems not such a bad thing if everybody's innocent, because that's just sort of a, let's get past this, let's speed it up, get this thing over with. But if he's guilty, it sounds like a mafia request, you know. Uh, I need your loyalty. So how you interpret this depends on your starting point. So instead of starting with the starting with the clues and the data and working towards some kind of a conclusion, um, people on both sides, I would say, have done the usual thing that people do. They started with their conclusion and then they worked backwards to use confirmation bias to make all the all the data fit. So you're not seeing anything that's too useful today because everybody's uh, <laughs> interpreting it the way they want. You may have noticed that the stock market is doing fine today, which means that people who have money have probably interpreted it, uh, the Comey testimony as not giving any kind of a smoking gun that would be a problem in the future. At least on average, that's what the market seems to be saying just by being calm. Um, now, the other thing that President Trump said that caused some controversy is that he also said to Comey in a private meeting about uh, Flynn, he hoped that Comey could, quote, let it go. Once again, it depends on your starting assumption. If President Trump believed that Flynn was a good guy who had done nothing wrong and was just trying to help the country, in that situation, asking the FBI to kind of let's get to it, you know, let's, let's get it over, let's get it, you know, let's let it go. Or any words to that, to those effect, 
would be fairly innocent under the condition that President Trump assumed there was no wrongdoing to be found. Right? Now, if he thought there was some wrongdoing, asking, asking them to hurry up and you know, get over it sounds completely different. Suddenly it sounds like this, again, it sounds like a gangster saying, uh, you know, I hope we can let it go. So it all depends on your starting point. And guess what? Only President Trump had a good idea of what his own belief was about his own innocence and his own belief about Flynn's innocence. And if he thought everybody was innocent, then asking Comey to get over it, you know, get past it, uh, you know, show, show your honesty and your loyalty, none of that sounds bad from an innocent person. <laughs> yeah, but if you assume he's guilty, or any or either of them are guilty, suddenly it takes on a nefarious quality. So you won't see anybody acting rationally today on the news. You'll see everybody retreating to whichever movie was already in their head. The, the country's falling apart, or hey, everything's fine except for the complaints. Uh, so that's what you're going to see today. All right, let's look at your comments. Um, <laughs> do you think enough people who take words out of context do it on purpose? You know, it's a combination. There's a little bit of uh, things taken out of context intentionally, especially by the pundits on television, because most of them are not attempting to be objective. They're partisans, and that's why they're there. They're professional partisans. So when they, st when they take things out of context or they avoid a question or they change the subject, you could just ignore all of that because there's no information being exchanged. It's just a partisan acting like a partisan. But if you're looking at citizens, your, your fellow citizens, you know, uh, or if you're from another country than the United States, you're looking at the, the voters of the United States. In those cases, some of them are partisan, but I think far more often, they're just uh, experiencing confirmation bias. They see the evidence in the news as supporting their view, no matter what the evidence is. That's how we're all wired. And by the way, it doesn't work differently on the other side. So, so you're seeing confirmation on both sides. You should be seeing it from me. And, and the fun part is that the only person who would be sure he can't tell the difference would be me. So if I'm experiencing confirmation bias, I wouldn't be able to detect it. That's what it is. It's the thing that the person can't detect. So when people say, you keep saying everybody's in confirmation bias and experiencing cognitive di dissonance, how do you know it isn't you? And the answer is, you don't. I don't know it's not me. I would have no way to know that. That's what it is. It's the thing that you can't know yourself. But let me suggest a few ways to detect if you have two parties and you think one of them might be close to right and maybe the other one is close to wrong, how do you objectively tell who's more likely, not for sure, but more likely to be the one hallucinating? I'll give you a few, give you a few tips. One way is if your side, if one of the sides, requires an analogy to make their case. Now, analogies are good for explaining something the first time to someone who hasn't heard it. But if you're using an analogy to say, aha, my analogy, therefore I'm done. Well, you haven't offered actually evidence about this specific situation. You've just said, this reminds me of something that was bad that's different. Right? Being reminded of something is not an argument. Right? If you're reminded of Hitler because you see somebody with a mustache, it doesn't really mean the person with the mustache is Hitler. So an analogy is almost always a tell for someone who doesn't have reason on their side. They don't have the facts on their side. And the reason that, you, that this is a strong tell is because nobody uses an analogy when the facts are on their side. Because you wouldn't. There would just be no reason. If, uh, if I said, you know, did you rob a bank? And you could point to a, you know, a video of you in someplace else at the time of the robbery, you'd use that first, right? You wouldn't say, well, let me tell you an analogy about the guy who was, who was once accused of a crime that was just like this. And you wouldn't use an analogy if you had any reasons, right? So, so whoever is using the most analogies probably is the one in the hallucination. 
That's, that's one way to tell. Um, and there's a second way to tell that uh, I'm going to have to actually check my own Twitter feed because I forgot what my second one was. Probably somebody here is going to tell me before I do it. How embarrassing I have to look at my own Twitter feed to feel, see what I tweeted. Bear with me. Hold on. Um, yeah, and the second one was, I should have remembered this one, is if you imagine that, the, that there's a problem based on you being able to read somebody's mind. In other words, if there is no crime based on what you're seeing, but there's definitely a crime based on your mind reading of a person you've never met who happens to be thousands of miles away in the White House, for example, if your case depends on you reading their minds, I'm not sure you're the one who's got the facts on your side. Because once again, if you have facts, you don't make a case based on imagining what somebody's thinking. Now, sometimes imagining what people are thinking is important if there's motive, right? But usually there's also you know, something connecting somebody to the crime. So you, you sort of need the, the facts before you do the mind reading. Um, yeah, the, the audio on here is bad. Let me, let me tell you my situation. So many of you have watched my struggle trying to get this YouTube configuration working. Um, and my hope was I would set it up and then it would be stable and then I could just come up here into my little studio and use it every time. So far, 100% of the times I've used it, almost all of the technology has failed on its own while I was just sitting there between uses. So I came back and my, today my microphone doesn't work. I don't know why. It's just plugged in and doing what it was doing before. Uh, but now it doesn't work. Uh, and it means some setting changed in the time that I was not using this. So... Uh, so I can improve this, but it's going to take a bunch of work. And even even the I had a little Chiron at the bottom of the screen. It's actually so hard to figure out how to do that. And so the UI is is so bad that doing it twice in a row is like it's like writing a term paper. It's like the hardest thing you could possibly do, even though it should be just opening a box and typing in some text. Bad interface. All right. Um, let me look at your questions, and then I'll see if there's anything left to do here. Um, my camera autofocuses, so I need to fix that, somebody said. Oh, I think for the autofocus, <laughs> the autofocus, I have to download something that I don't have, and... Uh, yeah, so that was interesting that Comey admitted leaking the memos. Um, my, my larger point about the whole situation is that when a situation reaches a certain level of complexity where people can't hold it all in their heads, there's, there's just too many bits of data in there, and you, you think you've got a grasp of it and you've, you've got a little bit of it worked out, it's like, okay, I understand this little part of it, and then the very next day, you see a new news item that says, oh, okay, I guess I didn't understand this. So we're all under this illusion that we now finally have got enough information that our opinions are based on facts. <laughs> and we're not even close to that point. Indeed, this is too complicated for the average citizen. And even as you watch the experts and the pundits, and even lawyers are disagreeing on television about what all this means. Right? So the people most capable of understanding this complex situation don't agree. So we don't really have a, uh, any chance of understanding it. But because all of the individual elements of it are kind of simple, it's a, it's a big complicated thing made up of a whole bunch of little simple things. So because we look at each simple thing and we go, oh, I get that. Somebody lied, somebody leaked. I know what those things are. I get this but you don't really understand them when they're all put together. So we have this big ball of, of uh, news about uh, Russia and Putin and Comey and, they all, and Flynn, and they all seem to, to be mixing together like this big you know, evil soup in our head. And when that happens, people just 
sort of uh, unconsciously and reflexively discard their sense of reason because it's not up to the, the challenge. We just don't have that that quality of, of brain that we can work out with situations like this. So instead, we just retreat to confirmation bias and say, well, hey, what a good day. Everything I heard today agreed with my with what I already thought. Um, an analogy, somebody saying that analogies can be useful in pointing out a flaw in someone's argument. 100% wrong. 100%. What you described is the illusion, not the useful part. When you think you're using an analogy to point out a flaw in somebody's argument, what you're actually doing is saying, instead of talking about the details of this thing, I'm going to talk about another thing that just reminds me of it. There's nothing there. It's a complete illusion that your analogy has somehow moved the conversation forward. It presented no reasons. It presented no facts. In fact, it literally, its only purpose was to mislead from the thing you're talking about to some other thing that you're just reminded of. All right? So anybody who thinks that an analogy is, well, okay, it's not proof, but it's a you know useful part of the reasoning process. You know, it's it has its role. Completely wrong. It is purely a hallucination that you think that. Now, analogies are not useless in general. They're great for literature, and they're really good for explaining something for the first time to someone who's not familiar with the concept. So, for example, if you were trying to uh, explain what a zebra was, it would be great if you could start with well. It's like a horse, and it's got some stripes on it, right? So it's always good to start with something that people recognize as just a framework, a way to understand the new thing you're introducing. But don't confuse that with any kind of reason, you know, this, this causes this, um, this must be true, there are no facts. The analogy is just sort of to take somebody from this, you know, area where they don't know what you're talking about yet and just focus them a little bit and say, okay, it's... It's, it's a situation a little bit like this, but that's as far as it goes. It's, it's not part of reason or debate. Um, <laughs> if you're trying to get somebody to understand the situation for the first time and they've not been introduced to the situation ever, then an analogy might be a way to get them in the door, but that's it. You know, if, if you're using analogies to further your argument, then you're just hallucinating that the analogies have, have some value that they don't have. Consider a court case. Have you ever heard, think of all the court cases you've seen on television, and in some cases you've been involved in them, maybe you've been on a, on a jury. Have you ever seen a lawyer argue with an analogy? You have not. Analogies are not evidence. They're not reasons. They're not anything. Now, you might see an analogy used if they're just introducing a point, like I said before, but it's not part of the argument. Today is my birthday. Um, I, I turned 60 today. Thoughts on psychoanalysis? Uh, mostly junk science, I think. Yeah, Freud, for example, has been debunked as as just pseudoscience. Thank you, thank you. You know, I'll tell you, um, changing the subject a little bit. If you had told me when I was 20 that at age 60, I would look and feel, at least, you know, fitness-wise looks, not, 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 not this part that's a train wreck. Uh, but if you told me that I would look and feel the way I do today at 60, I never would have believed that. Never. I, I'm literally at the peak of health. Um, I might be the healthiest person I even know. I, I don't know anybody who gets sick less than I do. Uh, I'm active every day. Um, So uh, one of the things I wanted to do, just when I look away, I'm looking at your comments coming in through YouTube. Uh, 
one of the things I plan to do in the coming days is talk about systems for uh, diet and exercise. And when I do that, you'll see some of the some of the ways of thinking that. Uh, oh my God! Somebody just gave me twenty dollars. Thank you, Richard. That was too nice of you. I'll, I'll buy myself lunch with that today on you. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> yeah, get that cauliflower out of the oven. That makes sense if you were reading the comments. If you weren't, that was pretty random. Yeah, do you remember how people looked when you were a kid? It's possible that we still look... <laughs> it's possible that I look to kids today exactly like old people looked when I was a kid. It could be a perceptual thing. But... Um, you know, at age 60, I could go out and play soccer. I could, you know, I could do anything I wanted. I, I don't have any real limitations. Um, <laughs> it's the thought that counts, people. All right, so uh, apparently I don't have much else to say on this. If you want to ask about Comey, uh, I'd be happy to answer that question. If you want to wish me happy birthday, I'd love that too. Uh, what do my workouts entail? I'll tell I'll tell you more about that in detail. But the um, the key to that is that people should do workouts that fit their um, their psychology. Meaning that if your workout makes you say oh, I don't want to do this tomorrow, that's a bad workout. If your workout says Well, that was all right. I had a good time. I had a nice beverage afterwards, met some people, got away from the house, cleared my mind. That's a good exercise because you'll figure out the details of exercise on your own just by doing it every day. You know, you'll, you'll pick up tips and, you know, good exercise habits. The thing you got to get right is the doing it part. So you got to work on the psychology first. So what I do is compatible with how I feel, my age, my, my resources, you know, what's convenient. Uh, so I don't recommend it. I, I just say that you should find that for you. You should find the thing for you that you can do almost every day that makes you glad you're doing it. And, and it's involved with fitness. If you find that, then everything else works out on its own. It just takes a while. Uh, the Comey Lynch thoughts. You know, the, the situation with Comey and Lynch is a good example of what I was talking about earlier where there's a certain level of complexity that's just sort of beyond what you know we humans uh, we humans are used to. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at my phone because I'm watching my brother. Let's see if you can see this. Yeah, you can't see it. Um, this is a, an app that my startup does. It's called WinHub, and you can see my brother not very clearly approaching my location on the map. So he's driving into town for my birthday, and I get to watch him all the way in. Um, <laughs> thoughts on nut job coming? Well, that's what we would talk about, unless you're talking about, uh, um, uh, unless you unless you're talking about the actual nickname. You know, I wasn't watching Comey's body language the whole time. Um, I, I don't think I detected... I'd have to say I didn't detect anything in Comey that looked dishonest. And that makes sense because um, it would be so easy for at least for a lot of things he could lie about if he wanted to. It seems like it'd be easy for you know the, the counter up evidence to be produced. So I imagine that for his own benefit, he told the truth. <laughs> uh, Comey lied about releasing the memo after Trump's tweet. Um, yeah, so here's the deal. Let, let's say that Comey did lie about leaking. Let's say he, he was asked and he lied about that. How big of a problem is that? Because the thing is that if you're a leaker, isn't part of the deal you don't tell people you did it? 
it's like that's what leaking is. You know, leaking is not, hey, everybody, I just gave a memo to somebody. You know, even after the fact, if somebody asks, hey, did you leak? A good leaker says, no, nah, I didn't leak. What are you talking about? Must have been somebody else. Right? That's just what leaking is. Now, if you want to get on your high horse, and, and yes, I am defending Comey here, so don't make, make no mistake, I have defended him before, and, and I'm doing it again. Uh, uh, if, if Comey had decided that leaking was good for, let's say, you know, the, the truth to come out, then to be a good leaker, part of, part of the deal is you don't tell anybody you're the leaker. So if you want to get on your high horse and say, my God, that Comey was not only a leaker plus a liar, I think you have to look at it in context. You've got an entire town, Washington, D.C., where every freaking person is leaking anything for any, any purpose, right? And presumably, if anybody asks them if they're a leaker, they're going to lie about it because that's what leaking is. It's leaking is not telling anybody you're the leaker. Um, so there, I'm not a lawyer. There may be some technical rule that was broken. Probably not, because Comey seems to know what he's doing in terms of navigating the law. So I imagine he he made sure he stayed on the right side of the law. Uh, if not, perhaps he would have said no comment or told people to talk to his lawyer. Um, but on the on the uh, you know, on the scale of terrible problems, being a leaker in Washington, D.C. seems like, you know, a, a low-end uh, problem. And it's especially low-end if, uh, if, if the reason you did it is not for pure political reasons, but to uh, help an investigation, get a, uh, in, the, in his case, he said to get a, pre a special prosecutor, uh, which might have been things that were good for the country. So if somebody's leaking in a way that, as far as you can tell, looks like it would be good for the process, good for the con Constitution, good for the country, it's just it was an easy way to do something. I think you got to give that guy, you know, a little bit of slack. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, for your birthday donations, which I totally don't deserve, uh, but I appreciate it so much. Um, it's just nice. It's just nice to be it's nice to be thought of. So I appreciate it. But you don't need to give me money on my birthday, please. Uh, yeah, show me the man, I will show you the crime. Yeah, there's certainly some. Uh, just checking on my brother. It's getting closer. You don't think he did it for control and politics? Well, the evidence that we have doesn't doesn't demonstrate that. And again, if 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 you think the crime is based on what you imagine people are thinking, then you might be the one who's hallucinating. Thank you. Thank you for the birthday wishes. Um, I think I'm going to wind down now because, as I said, my brother's getting close and I will talk to all you people soon thank you for joining me uh, <laughs> all right